we read in this week's Parsha, Parsha Shmos, how we initially went to Mitzrayim, 70 individuals, a family, Yaakov being the most special of the Ovos, Hakadoshim, of the patriarchs, and the his twelve sons being the Shifte Ko, being the each one the patriarch of his particular line. Despite all this, the influences of Mitzrayim were so overwhelming that ultimately other than Shevet Levi, because they were not actually part of the bondage, they became pagans. As we see on the way out, when they passed through the Yamsuf, after the sea split, the Malochim had said to Hashem, says, The water was a wall to the right and to the left. So the word Choma is written with the letter of Vav deleted. So without the vowels, it could be read Chema. The wrath was to the right and to the left. It was very intense prosecution against Klausha at that moment when they were passing through the walls of the sea. And the angels were saying, Why are you going to destroy the Egyptians? Elo of their reserve, Elo of their reserve. The Jews are no less pagans than the Egyptians themselves. So we became pagans. But you see something interesting. Although we became pagans, when the miracles, when the makos, the plagues began, which each one was a revealed miracle, within, relatively mm -hmm. speaking, a short period of time, they recovered. And they became monotheists just from witnessing the nisim gluyim, the makos, the plagues, which were all revealed miracles. Of course, it wasn't sufficient. The whole idea of Yitzis Mitzrayim that our Kodesh Baruch Hu took us out of Egypt was part of the purging process. Mitzrayim Gyal Toro Beis from Egypt we were redeemed. Egypt, it was a separate redemption. There were two things. We left the house of bondage and we, we were redeemed from Egypt. The whole Egyptian experience was part of, it was like miraculous. Somehow Hashem purged us from whatever that was. But of course, it was in conjunction with the revealed miracles. But we all understand that to be able to be purged, you have to have a capacity and a certain potential of the spirituality. Where did it all come from? So, simply you would say that since we are B'nai Avram Yitzchak Yaakov, we all descend from the Ovas HaKadoshim, that the dimension and the innateness of the Jewish soul is different than the non jewish soul. Fifty days after leaving Mitzrayim, we're standing at Sinai, saying Nasa Nishma. We became the equivalent of, of angels. We achieved a level of spirituality that we reverted back to pre-sin of Adam. And if not for the Chet Egel, we would have lived eternally. That would have been the reality. And, but where does this all come from? As I said, no question. That that Jews are Rachmanim, Baishonim, Gomli, Chasodim, we have compassion, we have shame, we have conscience, and we do Gemilas Chesed, this all comes from the Avos HaKadoshim, from the Holy Patriarchs. We are not only the biological descendants, we are the spiritual descendants. But it had to do with the mentoring, but it also had to do very strongly with what we read last week in the Parsha. We find that Yaakov had given a bracha to the sons of Yosef, Tephraim and Nasha, and he had said, The angel that redeemed me from all evil, Yivorech and Orim, should bless the youths. The Korivem Shemi, and the name, my name should be called upon them. Avosa Avram Yitzchok, 
and the name of my forefathers, Avram and Yitzchok. This is the bracha he had given them. And the Yidgul of the Kervoretz, and ultimately they should proliferate like fish in the midst of the land. So the Sifarno explains what is the idea of Yikorivem Shemig? They should be called by my name, Loshem Terach Venochor. Not the names of Terach, who was the father of Avram and Nochor, who was the forefather of Avram. Tzadikim, the name of their ancestors who are evil, are not called upon them. They have no connection. He says that a tzaddik only has relevance to a tzaddik. He has no relevance to the Russia. What was Avram's Yaakov's tefillah for his grandchildren? They should be in a state of preparedness and to be assisted to serve Akel Yisborach, to serve God. They should serve God in a way that they reflect and have relevance to Avram and Yitzchok. Al derech yached levovi lirishmecho. Cites a post who can deal him. As David says, designate my heart lirishmecho to fear your name. Meaning that we should have a capacity, we should have a potential to be able to actualize that potential. Yached levovi. Allow my heart to be exclusively designated Lirishmechov. This be Kori Bem Shmi, my name should be called upon you. Vishem Avose Avram Yitzhok. Who's Avram Yitzhok? This is the ultimate level of spirituality. You should have that level of designation of heart and emotion and mind to have that capacity. This is the Brocha that Yaakov had given his grandchildren. And we say Bchol Yivorch Israel and all Jews. The bracha we give our children should be like Ephraim and Nasha. So the bracha that Yaakov had given to Ephraim and Nasha to have this capacity of spirituality carries over to all Jews. All Jews bless themselves with that bracha which I had given to Ephraim and Nasha. So what is the potential? This is pre-Egypt. What is the potential of every Jew? My name and the name of my forefathers, Avram Yitzhak, every one of us, has relevance to them. There's a connection. They have a capacity that they should have the ability to actualize the potential to be connected to myself and to the, my predecessors, my ancestors, Avram and Yitzhak. Over here, the Arachim HaKadosh says, says two things, says something interesting. The Yikari Vem Shemi, they should have the status of the three ovos combined simultaneously. What does that mean? Whatever Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov were, you cannot diminish their status, their innateness. You cannot diminish it under any circumstance. Each one individually, you're not able to diminish. This is their dimension of being, of spirituality. And if you have all three combined, if one in the, each one individually you're not able to diminish and undermine that state of spirituality, that dimension of spirituality, so what if you have all three combined in one person? It's not a question. It cannot be undermined. But of course, a Jew could become a Russia. No question. But the question, what is the essence of the Jew? The essence of the Jew cannot, cannot be compromised in the way where it can never be reset or can never recover. Right? The concept, as the Gemara says, Yisrael Afbi Shechote Yisrael Hu, a Jew, even if he sins to the degree that he becomes an apostate, he's still a Jew. He still has the ability to do tshuva and a full return. Gedolim Tzadikim, Gedolim Balichuv Yosim, Gedolim 
Bali Chuva Yosem Itzadikim Gemurim. Bal Chuva the Mokesh Bal Chuva Omdim Tzadik Gemurim Omdim. Where Bal Chuva stands, even the Tzadik is not at the level of equal, of equal level. That's one interpretation we call him Shemig. That every Jew has the standing of all three of us combined. That he cannot be undermined to a point where he's beyond recovery. As Chazal tell us, based on the Pesuk, it says, Adukdukri Nefesh, that a Jew could do tshuva till the last moment of his life. As long as there's a flicker of life in him, he still could recover. If he does tshuva, proper tshuva. O Yirmos, Ki Yelem Chivuv Haskores Shmom Lefnei Hashem Ketev, Chivuv Haskores Shem Arvam Yitzhub Yaakov. Just as the Ovas HaKadoshim to God, there's a special love for them, there will be a special love for Ephraim and Nasha. Yikorivem Shemig. Just as my name is special in God's eyes, and I beloved him, Ephraim and Nasha should also be beloved. So, B'chol Yivarach Yisrael, every Jew, when we speak about Bonam Atem L'Hashem Elokechem, you God's children, at what level? This is the ultimate level of love. We find that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends Moshe Rabbeinu to Paro, he says, B'ni B'chori Yisroel. This is pre-Sinai. He says, B'ni B'chori Yisroel. My son, my firstborn Yisroel. The Jews are like my firstborn. A firstborn child is the most beloved to the father. What's B'ni B'chori Yisroel? Yaakov already said, V'hikori v'hem shemi v'shem avos avrav yitzok. This is all the love of all three of us combined into one being. So if each one individually, there was an exceptional love. So all three combined. And this is something we say on Rosh Hashanah and Zichronos. We want our Kodesh Baruch to remember, remember us in a good vein. Haben Yakali Ephraim, Yelet Shashuim. The child is Yakali, which is precious, Ephraim. Kimi Dabri Bo, when I speak about him, there's a special feeling of love towards him. Hashem. The name of Ephraim is precious in the eyes of God. And when he mentions the name of Ephraim, it's with a tremendous desire and an overwhelming level of love. This is Vikari Beb Shemik. So the Jew, this is B'ni B'chori Yisrael. It's God's children at what level? It's not my child. It's my most special child. As Ephraim, Ephraim is the equivalent of Avram Yitzchum Yaakov. So we speak about the Yikari Vem Shmi has a number of connotations. It's the potential of the Jew. V'yachid l'vavein l'avli l'yiru es Hashem alokecho. He quotes the Posuk. Yachid l'vavu l'yiru shmecho. Designate my heart to fear your name, to give me the capacity, the ability to internalize and to grasp it and become that. Every Jew has that. We go to Egypt. We become over the we become pagans. Although they still culturally, they're still Jewish. Lushina Lushonam, they didn't change their names. Their language, their names, Shmosam, Umalbusham, and their clothing. The attire was Jewish attire. The names were Jewish names, the language they spoke Hebrew. That they had that. And they were pagan. They were pagan Jews. But the question is, how do you recover from such a level? The answer is, because what is their essence? Their essence is, Vikari Beim Shemi B'Shem Avosa Avram Yitzhak. That's their essence. We find that Yaakov, before he passed on, he gave a bracha to every one of his children. And that bracha, now when you give some, someone a bracha, Yaakov's blessing, it's not, they became that because he gave them the blessing. Yisachar's bracha, that he's the charom chamor gorim, he's the big bone donkey who carries the burden of Torah. Harovitz ben Mishbasayim, who rests between the boundaries. It's because Yisocha had that innate ability and potential to become that. 
the bracha is only the blessing he gave was to secure what his essence is. Zvulun l'chof yamim, that he's the merchant who's able to esteem a revered Torah to the degree that to support the Torah of Yisrochem, nothing's too difficult. He's dedicated to the nth degree to provide for Yisrochem. Again, because Yaakov understanding the essence, the spiritual makeup of the Yisrochem, of Zvulun, it was the appropriate bracha. Again, it was to secure that. And the same thing was true with every one of them. Yudah's leadership. Yudah is royalty, is melech. He is the legislator. He's the king. That's because Yudah, that was his essence. This was only to designate it and to secure it in place that that's what should be. So what Yaakov had given the bracha to Ephraim and Nasha and B'choy Yivorech Yisroel it's not he created what we call a Yeshmiyayan. They had no relevance to this. Chas Risholam. Ruvim Shimon, Ephraim and Nashka Ruvim Shimon Yuli. They're the equivalent of tribes. They were the equivalent of tribes. They were the children of Yosef. So again, Yikorabem Shmi B'Shem Avose Avram Yitzchok. It's only because they had that innate special spirituality. Now they have a capacity to have relevance to what we are, all three of us combined. Why are the others so beloved to Hashem? Because they were just beloved, because of what they were, what they accomplished, and the level of sacrifice, and the level of reverence for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That means because every Jew has that value, every Jew, therefore Hashem has that special love for Klal Yisrael. We read at the beginning of the parsha of Elush Mos Bnei Yisrael, Haboim Yitzroyma, and these are the names of the Bnei Yisrael who came to Egypt, who are coming to Egypt. Es Yaakov, Ishu Veisobo, together with Yaakov, each person with his household, they had come. What is the vav, the Eile? And these are the names. It should start, Eile Shmos Bnei Yisrael Bo Mitzrayim. These are the names of Bnei Yisrael who came to eat what and these are. And is always a connection. So here the Orachim HaKadosh explains, Tam Omro Ve'ele B'Tosef is vav. Why does the Parsha begin with the additional vav? Would have been enough to say, and these are the, these are the names. What's and these are the names? Lilmod aleim kikulam tzadikim kaboseim. They teach us that they were like tzadikim, like their forefathers. The family of Yaakov who had come, Ruve, Shimon, Levi, Yudah, these people mentioned, they were tzadikim like their forefathers. Who were their forefathers? So again, they lemosev al rishonim, ma rishonim lohem. Who were the the early tzadikim? Avram Yitzchok of Yaakov. Tzadikim el yonim, kamas ovus osu abonim. They were the most exalted tzadikim, the ovus hakadoshim. Eile, they are similar to they are to them. So Eile is to establish this commonality, this similarity. So again, so why did we have relevance to the bracha, the kori vem shmi b'shem avosai? Because they had relevance to that. Because they had relevance in capacity to them. Therefore, they received that brocha. That's ve'ele. They continued in that, in that vein. We find Chazal tell us, it says the land could not carry Yaakov and Esav. And Esav went past Har Seir, to Mount Seir. So Rashi over there cites Chazal that Esav understood that there was a debt that had to be paid. 
And what was the debt? The debt which had to be paid, it's what happened during the Brisbane Absorium, the covenant between the parts. Your children will be strangers in a land which is not theirs. They will be enslaved, they'll be oppressed, they'll be afflicted, and ultimately they'll go out with great wealth. So whoever was going to be the heir of Eretz Yisrael has to pay the debt. Asim says, I'm not interested in paying that debt. So he chose to leave. Yaakov says, we will pay that debt. We will pay the debt. Of course, what is Eretz Yisrael? Eretz Yisrael is what? Kolador b'chutzles ke'en lo a person lives outside of Eretz Yisrael, it's like you have no God. It's Eretz HaKadosh, it's the Holy Land. What was Asim willing to pay for? Only the material. He had no appreciation, no capacity to appreciate the spiritual. Yaakov says, that we find when it says he wore seven hard years for Rachel as a wife, it was like a blink of an eye. It was like a few days. How is seven years of hard labor like, like a few days? And Lovin believed he actually was getting the better, the better deal. I'll give away my daughter. Seven years of such wealth, such a return on your investment. Yaakov was the other Bachodim. Because Lovon did not understand what the value of Rochel was. Rochel is Yosef and Binyamin. Rochel is the ultimate future. Rochel is eternity. What are you willing to pay for eternity? Whatever I pay, it's a pittance in terms of what I get in return. We have to pay a debt 210 years in Egypt. And therefore what? But what is, the, what is the end result? Sinai. What is Sinai? All existence was created for Sinai. What do we receive? First of all, we become the Am Hashem. We become the Am Anivchar. We become God's people. We receive the Lekach Tov no Sadlachem, Tarosayatazovu. We receive the ultimate commodity. God's, God's commodity. God refers to as, as Tov. This is what we're receiving. So, of course, Yaakov says, of course I'll pay the debt. What kind of question is it? Esau, he flees. He fled from that debt. I don't need the headache. I don't need the problem. Before, why did he sell the Bechor initially? Yaakov explained to him, you know, if you're a Shuya Yain, if you drink wine, or you're Puri Rosh, you don't, you're not groomed, you don't take a haircut. Within 30 days, you have liability. He says, you know, I'm not interested in dying. I'm not interested in ha being, having my life ended before my time. What do you mean? So you don't drink wine. If you understand what it means to serve God, to become God's efficient, you should be willing to give it all away. But that's not Esav. Esav has no appreciation for that. The Eilish most B'nai Yisrael. What is the Eilish? Marisham Yodu Vikiru Begolus. Just as Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov understood and they recognized what exile means. The Kibbal Aleim al Zarum, they accepted upon themselves, were willing to suffer and sacrifice. Because what is the end result of this? Kamo Kain Eilech, the generation came to Egypt. This is not the other Sakadoshi. But they were no different than the forefathers. Vu Omram Ve'ela, most of the Vachnu, Tam, Nochon. Why is the Torah mentioning them again? They were counted in, in Vayigash when they came to Egypt. Shramonim parshas Vayigash biyudosel Mitzrayim. The answer is because mentioning because why did they come now? They came Eilish most Neisabon. They came specifically to pay the debt, knowing that they're going to suffer, knowing they're going to be afflicted, knowing even the possible consequences that children will become pagans. But if that's the debt that has to be paid, we're paying the debt. Because ultimately, there's a promise, there's a guarantee. Pokut pokarati. After so many years, there's going to be a goel, there's going to be a redeemer, and we'll be taken out of all this. Udurachenu akos of yodiyatam minyonom. What the Pasuk is revealing, informing us, 
Shemona hu vaholech v'seif Torah mi hu v'mi habol l'kabel gzeres melech lizbol ol hagolos. Who are those who are coming to accept the decree of God to suffer the yoke of exile? Lopona orev kemas Esav harosha shola chaleretz b'mne Yaakov. Not like Esav who fled, went to Harseir. V'dorshu zal. In the star hopes al Golos, there was a debt, there was a document of debt to be paid. Pirish Abom Lisbon and Ola Golos Mitzrayim, as Yaakov Ito, as Yaakov, together with him. Baskoma Achas, they came with one mind, as Yaakov. As when Yaakov came to Egypt, it was to pay the debt, they came, as Yaakov, one of the first Achov Agolos. Over here, the Medrash tells us, Omer Bavo, Kol Mokshinema Eilech, Posel is showed him. It says, these, these are, that goes and disqualifies the early ones. These are the inferences, and the early ones, the previous ones were not. V'chol Mokshinema Ve'ele, and these are, most of Sheva Chal Rishonim. Not only were the early ones special, these are also. This adds praise on the early ones. What, what's adding the praise? With the Rachim HaKodesh, it's very good, the Medrash. The Eile. It says, Eile HaShvotim, Ruvei Shimon Levi. Eile Shmos, Hosef Sheva HaLarishonim. That despite the fact that they knew that it was Golos, they were no different than Yaakov. Just as Yaakov stayed in Eretz Yisrael, although there was a, a document of debt that had to be paid, Eilish Mos, they were also coming to pay the same document, the same debt, knowing in advance what they're going through, what, what they're going to have to experience. The Midrash, the Dubna Magid, speaks about this. What was the the end of the statement of the Brisbane Absorium? They'll be enslaved for so many years, afflicted. This is why Hakadosh Baruch said to Moshe Benu, "Please ask him to borrow the personal effects of the Egyptians, the gold, the silver, the garments, and so on and so forth." And this is the fulfillment of Achachet of Ruchosh Godel. Then they will go out afterwards with great wealth. The Medrash, there's a Medrash that says, Achachet of Ruchosh Godel is Sinai. The ultimate Ruchosh, the ultimate wealth, is what they receive at Sinai, the Torah. So he goes to explain the Dubna Magid. He says, You have a person, he worked for, he was a young man, he worked for his father's good friend worked three hard months and his father, his friend, gives him a note for working three months, five thousand dollars, which is a very large amount of money. The son was a young boy, he was illiterate. He couldn't read the, what, what was written on, what was printed on the paper, what was written on the paper. Five thousand dollars for three months worth of work. Comes back, he, he sees the son's upset. Just father says, what do you say? He says, look here, I put three Long, hard months gives me a piece of paper with some scribbling on it. He understands it, some doesn't understand. So he goes to his friends and do me a favor take a few shiny silver coins, put them in a the bag, give it to him, and let it jingle. My son will be in seventh heaven. My son doesn't understand what the value of the paper is. I'm sure he gives it. Son's ecstatic. Feels he really accomplished, earned something which he's happy with. When we left Egypt, 
every day out of Egypt, we ascended another level of purity. When we left Mitzrayim, we, we didn't have the capacity yet to appreciate what the value of the ultimate spirituality is. The whole concept of becoming the Amashem, Talmud Torah Kenegat Kulam, what the Torah is. We didn't understand the innate value of Torah. We didn't have a capacity to understand it. It was a process. It took 49 days till we, received, we arrived at Sinai. Only then did we have the capacity to appreciate what the Ruchosh Godel is. So there are two stages. There's the elementary stage. That's the coins that jingle. That's the 40 or 10 pack animals loaded with the wealth of Egypt. This is something special. Massing all this tremendous wealth, material wealth. But the ultimate wealth is what? The ultimate wealth. That's the Torah. That's becoming the Amashem. This is Yisrael Varaisim Kuchu Brichu Chadu. To become one bonding to God through Torah this is the ultimate level. But it's we didn't have that capacity. This is the difference between Yaakov and Esau. This is Ve'edu Shmos B'nei Yisrael Abom Mitzrayimah. The B'nei Yisrael, it's very good. This is Pre-Sina. Ve'edu Shmos B'nei Yisrael Abom Mitzrayimah. Es Yaakov. Why are they coming to Egypt? Because they're the, they're the biological children of Yaakov. Or B'nai Yisrael, who was speaking about this, the spiritual profile. They're coming to pay the spiritual debt. And once the spiritual debt is paid, then we soar. Then we become part of eternity. Then we could go to Sinai and become the Ama Nifchar, the Ama Shem. Become God's people, the chosen people. He cites a Zohar says later, as they afflicted us, that's how they thrived. They, inc they increased in number and they thrived. King Yifrotz. So the Orchayim HaKodesh, that post excites the Zohar. Mayerav Nimos HaKosuf Al Pima Shepirshim Zohar. He says, how pleasant and how sweet is the Pesuk when it says, as they afflicted us, we increased in number and we thrived. The Pesuk says, the Zohar goes on the Pesuk, Esa she shola to odom ba odom luralo. Pesuk Kohelis. When man dominates another person to, do, to harm him, to do bad, evil with him, as a result of the medium of affliction and suffering, we're able to filter out, to separate the good from the evil. Every human being has an intermingling of evil with good. How do you somehow filter out the good, to separate the good from the evil? So the Zohar says, as a result of suffering and sorrows, and pain, affliction and pain, tisbar b'chinas atov me'ara, v'tismach el chela katov, and you'll be able to rely on that good part. V'tisbar b'chinas ara me'chela katov, v'tismach el b'chinas. So each one will be separated and will be identified in, independently. Ubeis prote melu remuzim b'omo laralo. V'atzmo shomer akos kashiyanu also ken keshiro inui. To the degree that we afflicted, to the degree they afflicted us, that extracted the goodness, the purity. So when we say we're not talking about necessarily only in the physical sense. Our dimension, our dimension increased in value because we were we were more purified. We represented the good because the evil was, was actually was extracted from us through the suffering. The morale explains this to mean that what is the difference between the Jew and a non Jew? The essence of the Jew is spiritual. That's the essence of the Jew. It's not our physicality. Our physical setting is only the circumstance. That is the context which we make a choice. 
What is the value of the world? To be in a position of the struggle and ultimately to choose good over evil. So, material is purely a circumstance for choice. But what's the essence of the Jew? The essence of the Jew is, is spiritual. Because of what the Ovis HaGadoshim, what they had invested in spirituality, and they gave the spiritual the upper hand. The non-Jew is not that. So, when we speak about spiritual versus, versus, versus physical, physical is finite. Limitation, that's physical. Everything, space, time and space, it's all limitation. Spiritual has no limitation. So if the Jew, in his essence, is an unlimited being, what puts limitation on the Jew? Of course, his connection to physicality, to material. If you live like a physical being, then you have a limitation. A person who lives as a spiritual being is unlimited. I'll give you an example. A person who lives with tremendous emun and bitochon, belief and faith in God. That person, he doesn't have to take initiatives what the ordinary person has to take. He's not limited. He's not limited to the physical phenomena of the world. Well, how do you make ends meet? It's irrelevant. If you deal within the finite system, you have to work within the system. This person, his essence and his existence is not within the finite existence. He finds himself in the finite existence. But what, how does he live his life within the finite existence? Not as a finite person. It's my belief and my faith. Therefore, he transcends and he supersedes the system. God provides. You're not limited because that's not, that's not what you are. This is what the Jew is. So why does the Jew proliferate in an unlimited number? Because I'm limited to the physical. What about if they afflict us, they torture us, and their intent was what? To minimize us. The more the person is minimized physically, the less he's prolific. With the Jew is just the opposite. The more they minimized us physically, the more they thrived and they proliferated. That's only to confirm the essence of the Jew. That the essence of the Jew is a spiritual being within a physical context rather than a material being. And to what degree did they thrive? We're talking about Shisha Bekeres Echod. Six in every litter. We're talking about staggering numbers in every birth. It's unheard of. But again, it was to confirm the essence of what the Jew was. So, the, I mean, it's not contradictory to the Zohar. But it's the same thing. The more we separate the evil from the good, that means the spirituality is more pure. If there's less intermingling of the physical, which is represent, that represents the evil, in the, in the spiritual, then of course it's more pure. It has, greater, it has greater potential. It's more far-reaching. This is the idea. find the turret at the Seder wheat mora, wheat bitter herbs what do we bitter herbs was a result of we increased they appointed taskmasters over us sorry misim to afflict us in our in our work in our overwhelming unbearable work in the bondage that says by immoral chayim they embitter their lives, Bavoda Kosher. They embitter their lives with hard work. So to commemorate the bitterness of the bondage, we more on a Torah level, when the Bismidish stood, existed, Mora was a Torah obligation. We ate it together with the Korm Pesach, with the Paschal Lamb. Today that we don't have the Bismidish, it's purely commemorative. To commemorate the bitterness, the embitterment of the Egyptian to the Jew, we'd Mora. 
But Mora initially, what is there? A number of species which one could fulfill the mitzvah of Mora. What is the first choice of it, of that species? It's not something which is innately bitter, such as more as horseradish. It's something which is lettuce. It's why? So the Gemara explains, because lettuce, if you pick it in time, it's sweet. But if you leave it in the ground, it turns bitter. How did the bondage start? It started with Perach. They sweet-talked us. They encouraged us. But when we allowed ourselves to be pulled into, assuming the various levels of, of work, it turned into bondage. It started off sweet. It turned, it turned out to be very bitter. So therefore, what truly commemorates the whole saga of where it began and how it ended, it's represented through the lettuce, which is initially sweet and ultimately is bitter if you leave it in the ground. But that, that's what Mora is. So the Chazal tell us, when, did, when was the most intense level of bondage? So the Gemara tells us, when Miriam was born, that's when they intensified the bondage. And that's why Miriam was called Miriam from the word Morim. Miriam is Morim. That was the most bitter time. When she was born, that's when they legislated and they decreed the, most, the harshest part of the bondage. Now the question is, why? Why? So the morale in the Gvur Hashem explains, Vizeh, when did they embitter the lives when Miriam was born? Now, when Miriam was born, Miriam was one of the was was one of the three overseers of Klal Yisrael. As the Gemara says, there were three good parnosim. There were three special Jews who were responsible for Klal Yisrael. Moshe, Aaron, Miriam. We had the Mon in the merit of Moshe. We had the clouds of glory, the Ani Yaakovot, in the merit of Aaron. And we had the Be'er, we had the wellspring which traveled with us for 40 years. That was in the merit of, merit of Miriam. So Miriam was part of the Gula. She was ultimately part of the Gula. We couldn't survive the desert unless we had that Be'er. We had that wellspring traveling with us. So now, the moment Miriam is born, what happens? There's a resistance. There's an opposing force. Miriam represents extrication from bondage. So when you want to extricate yourself from a setting where the setting doesn't want to release you, what happens? There's a tension. It intensifies. In her marriage, she was necessary for the gula because in her merit we had the wellspring. The door shows about Miriam Yosef Hefech, the Mitzrayim. Surely Miriam Sibel Gulosam, the generation which Miriam lived in, that generation is leaving Egypt. So ready, the extrication is starting. What happens when, when there's about can, there's going to be a transition? There's a what? There's a reaction to that transition. There's a resistance to that transition. Um Mitzrayim Sibel Shibudam. What was the cause of the bondage? Egypt. When you have two forces, which are opposing forces, what happens? They oppose one another. So Egypt, now that Miriam's born to existence, that this generation ultimately is going to be the generation that's going to leave Egypt. So what happens? We have two opposing forces. So when they oppose one another, it is an intensification. Therefore, when Miriam was born, that she represents the ultimate, the beginning of the Gula, this is when it intensified. This is Yoser. Therefore, the bondage at that moment when she was born, it intensified, and that was the most bitter part of the bondage. This is the embitterment. At that particular moment. It's not a conscious thing. Just the reality. We find that after Moshe Rabbeinu comes and he present, presents his credentials, that he's the Goel, that he's the Redeemer, he says, Pokot Pekarati, says the Egyptians, they withdraw the straw subsidy. And they demand the same quarter of bricks. And things became a lot worse. 
So Moshe Rabbeinu comes to Hakadosh Baruch Hu and says, "Lama Rosa Lama Zelama Zef Shlachtoni." Why are you making it so difficult? This is supposed to be Gula. If this is redemption, it's supposed to get better, not worse. So he says, "Why are you making it so 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 difficult for the Jews? Why don't you send me to be redeemer?" Hakadosh Baruch Hu says, "Atu Tira," because you asked the question which was not an appropriate question. You will see the Gula now, but the entry into Eretz Israel you will not see because of that question you asked. So over there, the Orachim HaKadosh explains why do things have to get worse before they get better? So he quotes the Gemara. The Gemara tells us that what's the darkest part of night? The end of night is the darkest part of night. What is the coldest part of winter? The end of winter. The hottest part of summer is the end of summer. Why is it always the end? It's always the most intense part, the most intense representation of that particular period. He explains that when HaKadosh Baruch created the world, it was in the context, whenever a transition is about to happen, the previous state resists that change, resists the transition. So therefore, when night is going to dawn, there's a transition. It's, it's a different period of time. There's a resistance. Because that resistance, there's an intensification of the nighttime period. Therefore, the nighttime period is the darkest part. Winter is a transition into spring. So again, whenever there's a transition, there's a resistance. So therefore, it's the coldest. Summer into fall, there's a resistance. Therefore, it's the hottest part. Gula is about to take place. So what's Gula? Freedom. You're not, no longer subject to the bondage. A transition is about to take place. So before it gets better, it has to get worse. Because there's a resistance to that transition. This is why things had to get worse. That's why they drew, withdrew the straw subsidy. Moshe Bain didn't understand that. If he says, Loma Reyesu, Loma no, that, that's a confirmation. That confirms the gula. Because if the gula is not about to happen, it wouldn't have intensified. Miriam is the beginning. This is the beginning. The Yimor Chayim. Since she represents the gula, which ultimately, and she's integral to the gula, because only because her, we had to have a bear, we had to have a wellspring, and the wellspring existed only in her merit. Mm -hmm. So she represents already the gula. So her generation is the generation that's leaving Egypt. Having that is sufficient already to activate a force, a sense that this, we have opposing forces here. You have gula versus bondage. Therefore, there's intensification. Therefore, it's vayimor chayim b'avodah kosher. It's interesting. We say, kolas cholos koshos. Whenever you begin something, you always begin it with difficulty. Could be it's also, especially when we speak about spirituality, the person becomes a balchuva. Mm -hmm. The beginning of balchuva, the person who truly wants to make a change in his life, it's very difficult. Things come out of nowhere, which always interfere. Endless obstacles. And it's not the person himself who wants to be the balchuva, is what we use in the vernacular. He's sab sabotaging himself not sabotaging himself. The Sultan, the Yitzharad, doesn't let go. Why? Again, there's a transition. And this transition is probably the most important transition in existence. Going from an intellectual animal into a spiritual being. This is the ultimate level of transition. He doesn't let go. The physical doesn't let go. It's holding on. Holding on for life. Because what's going to happen is a different dimension of being. This is Winter to summer to spring is, 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 is minimal compared to what's happening here. So you can imagine what the level, what the level of resistance is. This is the kolas cholos koshos.
ואילו שמוס. נו מהשמש לישראל, the names which are mentioned are something very appropriate for כלל ישראל. עד מוצי שהקדוש ברוך הוא קורא להם שמוס, we find there's certain people that Hashem, he called them by that name. נוסן בן לאברום, a child was, a son was given to Avram, Vayomelo, Vakorosa Eshmo Yitzhak. Who chose the name for Yitzhak? HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, you should call him Yitzhak. It's interesting. Why did God call him Yitzhak? Right? Why? I mean, Avram could have come up with the name himself. No, Hashem says, you must call him Yitzhak. Yitzhak was, was a miracle child. She was barren. Sorry, meaning when she was 89, she conceived. So, who actually brought this child? Although, I could, it says, it's three partners in every child, in every human being. The father, the mother, and a Kodesh Baruch Hu. But this is, this is a miracle. Within the context of nature, this child couldn't have been. So who clearly altered nature to allow this child to be born? A Kodesh Baruch Hu. So therefore, Hashem says, this is the name I choose I communicate, this is the name he should be given. But what is Yitzhak? Yud Asoro. Yud numerically is 10. Tzadi is Tishim. 90, so that's 100. Ches Shmono. Ches is 8. Kuf Meyo. And Kuf is 100. So what does it add up? All the numerical value of all the letters. Ari Mosai It's 210. Umasayim v'eseshonim osi yisrob mitzrayim. How many years did we spend in Egypt? 210 years. So he explains in the commentary of Eitz Yosef that it says, it says, Ubi Yitzchok yikor l'chozorah. Yitzchok, all his progeny are not the progeny of, 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 of Klal Yisrael. Yitzchok had Esau. Ubi Yitzchok. So Beis, the miracle valve of Beis is two. So Yitzchok is 208. The Yitzchok with the Beis that will be your progeny. Meaning, the progeny will spend 210 years. Through the 210, will you have progeny. This is, this is the meaning of the Chazal. Keep Yitzchak, you call it for The question is, what about Avram? Avram is not part of the equation. So you could say, because if Yitzchak is the father of Yaakov, and Yaakov is the ultimate so among the patriarchs, he fathered the Yud Bei the 12 tribes, the Shif Dei mm-hmm. Therefore, everything is quantified through Yitzchok. We find that Avram was exposed to the world. Sorry, he was exposed to the world. They were exposed to the worst. But Avram was Avram. But we find when Ishmael was not behaving properly, he was mitzachek. His behavior reflected certain aspects of idolatry, adultery, or murder. So what does Sari Menu say to Avram? Drive this maidservant with a son from the house. I'm concerned of the influence. Because his presence in our home will compromise Yitzchak. Even as much as an iota. Sari Menu understood what, who, what Yitzhak had to be. And even the slightest degree of compromise will affect Klal Yisrael for all eternity. Yitzhak has to father, has to father Yaakov, has to father Ubi Yitzhak, Yikor of Ozara. Within Yitzhak, not all the Yitzhak. Esau has no relevance to Yitzhak. Ubi Yitzhak. Within Yitzhak, Yikor of Ozara. Not all the progeny of the progeny. So therefore, it's, it's in, the, in the Yitzchok of that progeny. That's the reason why, because he's the one who's fathering Yaakov. This is the redu. This is the 210 years that we spent in Egypt. <coughs> Actually, Chazal tell us that the bondage was meant to be 400 years. So when do I start calculating 400 years from the birth of Yitzchok? Because it says, Gir Yeh Zarachov. 
A stranger shall be your progeny. So when did the years they began to be calculated? Geri Yezarachov, from the birth of Yitzhok. So the Medjur says, Ches represents Shmona. Shmona Zimei Milo. He was circumcised. When does Yitzhak already have relevance to spirituality? When he's eight days old. That's the bris. This is the bris kodesh. Ki bi Yitzhak ki kora. When does Yitzhak have relevance to Yaakov? Which is spirituality. It's the ches. The ches represents the milah. Esau was never circumcised. Esau was never circumcised because he was red and Yitzchok had believed maybe he's a, he, he, he may be a hemophiliac and circumcising he'll, he'll bleed to death so he never circumcised him even though later he realized after it was too late he couldn't do the meal on him Yaakov was born circumcised he didn't need circumcision but again the Ches Yitzchok 208 so there's a morale which I always mention I mean factually how, how did the bondage start at from the birth of Yitzhak. I mean, Avram was Avam Goyim. He was the father of all nations. He had wealth, which is unheard of. Yitzhak had wealth unheard of. Yaakov, although he's the patriarch of exile, but he wasn't, he wasn't, there was no bondage. So how do you consider the years of the Ovos, Kadoshim, Avram and Yitzhak? How do we calculate from the birth of Yitzhak to be added to the 400 years? To be calculated as a big part of 400 year period. So the Raoul explains it this way. He says something phenomenal. He says that what is bondage? Bondage is oppression. You're in an environment which is oppressive. A person lives as a spiritual being. And all your interest is, is only in spiritual growth. And you're engulfed and surrounded with everything that's contrary to your being witchcraft, idolatry, promiscuity it's revolting we're talking about Tovas Kenan who says the land spit them out because they were so because of their abominations you know what Avram had to be exposed to you know what Yitzchak had to be exposed to Avram had to deal with an Avimelech he had to deal with a Paro Yitzchak had to deal with Navi Melech. He had to deal with the Egyptian people. He had to redig the wells because they sealed the wells. This is all spiritual. This is a spiritual struggle. So what was he? What he experienced within spiritual oppression, it's worse than a physical oppression. Therefore, that's bondage. From the birth of Yitzchak, this is when the bondage started. Because that spiritual bondage was the equivalent of, of the material bondage. What happens if you start slipping, spiritually speaking? So then, there's no spiritual, there's no, no oppression any longer. So how does the bondage have to manifest itself? In the physical? So when the Jews came to Egypt, we were what? We were, we were fully intact spiritually. We were spiritually sound. What happened when that whole generation passed away? Their behavior started to change. Their values blurred. They stopped circumcising themselves. So now if you stop circumcising yourself, because you want to be like an Egyptian, so how must you experience bondage? Being spiritually deprived is not bondage. Because that's exactly what you want to be. You don't see it as, a, as being deprived. So now we have to start the material bondage. That's physical oppression. So therefore, factually, Golos started Avod Vinamosam. That that you'll be in bondage is from the birth of Yitzhak. When they came to Egypt, that was also calculated as the bondage. Even though the whole generation was intact, spiritually fu functional. But once that generation passed on, and the Jews started slipping, they no longer appreciated the value of their spirituality. So what is considered a affliction now? You have to be physically afflicted. What you value, that's what you're going to be deprived. Your freedom, you're not going to have that freedom anymore. And this was the Golos. And what was the ultimate? The Yemorah Chayim. Because again, this is a transition from the physical to the spiritual, which is the ultimate level of transition.